You know, the Bible is a way of life, and many people said, well, you know, I've, I've been born again. But have you really been called? And how do you know? The Bible also tells us who is going to be called, and it also gives us the guidelines on being faithful. Stay tuned for an interesting Discover the Truth wherein we go through this subject and find out exactly what it means to be called to the truth of Almighty Yahweh. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? When I was in school, one of my favorite poems was Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken. It tells about life and it tells about walking along the road of life. It goes like this. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that passing there, had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black, Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, Yahshua the Messiah told us something very significant. He said here, that many are called, but few are chosen. Even though many are called to hear the message, only a relatively few will be faithful to that message. Only a small number, relatively small number, out of the billions on earth will be chosen to join the kingdom of Almighty Yahweh as priests under that kingdom, ruled by Yahshua the Messiah. And this, of course, happens in the millennial reign, the thousand-year rule that will follow this life. The scriptures call it a narrow way, and it is a lot narrower than most think. Even the Apostle Paul was unsure of his own salvation until the end. He said in 2 Timothy 4.8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Master, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You know, for the mass, vast majority of the people, the Bible way of life is too great a challenge. It's not well traveled. It's not an easy way. It's not compacted and smooth and straight and level like the many more popular ways. It has some hills, it has some valleys, sharp turns, potholes, you name it. It lacks what most people are accustomed to. There are challenges and overcoming of our sinful natures on this road. On this road, there's much of the culture and its allures to give up. It requires real effort, much faith, and perse perseverance. It's not without its discomfort and critics, unlike the four-lane easy believism that's out there all over the place. The road less traveled is a road for the select few, but then so is the prize. Imagine a position of leadership, of rulership, in the coming kingdom, the all-encompassing Goal in today's culture is ease and comfort, convenience. Unless it takes no effort and is expedient in all situations and circumstances, most people simply have no heart for it, no desire. It all boils down to a lack of genuine faith and trust in Almighty Yahweh and His Word and a desire to live those words here on earth in our lives. 
On one of the home improvement networks is a show called Yard Crashers. A landscaper approaches shoppers in a home improvement store and tells them he'll come over to their home with a team of professionals and transform their ugly, beauty-challenged yard in two days into a virtual paradise. The kicker is they'll need to volunteer a little of their own help and sweat. And it'll be no cost to them, but it's going to take a little bit of their own initiative for this yard makeover. They'll end up with a picture-perfect backyard, all free of charge. Some get gazebos, outdoor kitchens, fountains, miniature golf courses, all kinds of good things. But all they must do is help build it with his guidance. What is amazing about it is that most people who hear the offer turn him down. They simply don't believe him or are too busy or don't care to take the effort. In one episode, as he tries to persuade one lady, you can hear another shopper in the background saying, do it, do it, I know who he is. But she still refused. You know, we can carry this same idea to the Bible. People are offered something invaluable and it doesn't cost them anything but a little of their dedication. And somebody's saying, do it, do it. They read in the scriptures, they know it's, it's right and they know it's good, but they just can't seem to accept it. Sometimes we who carry this message of biblical exhortation feel kind of like the yard crasher. We have a message that will change lives for an eternity. You can't put a price on salvation. All it takes is personal commitment to truth, here and now. You know, it's difficult to comprehend why so many turn it down. When it's all over, having rejected it, they'll be kicking themselves like the rich man looking up from the bottom of the grave in Yahshua's parable, seeing himself shut out of salvation and asking, oh, why did I not accept the call when I had the opportunity? You know, the saints, both historically and today, are the independent thinkers, those who don't live for the world or follow the crowd. They want more than what this life has to offer. If you are one of them, we invite you to look into this message and find out what you have been missing. We have a special booklet for you today called, But I Speak English. And this booklet tells about the Heavenly Father's true name. Many people say, well, I don't need to use that name Yahweh because that's Hebrew and I speak English. I use God instead. Well, first of all, God is not English. And so that doesn't work. Find out what his true name is and you'll find out where salvation lies because he is the author of salvation. We invite you to write for this booklet or request it online. It's free of charge. And we'll be back in just a minute. Well, it was really nice talking to you. I have to go. God bless. Uh, wait, before you go, did you know that God is not the name of the Heavenly Father? But my Bible says that God is his name. If it's not God, then what is it? It's Yahweh. Yahweh, I've never even heard of that name before. My Bible doesn't say the name Yahweh, it says God. It's, uh, it's Hebrew. It was in the original scriptures, but later it was substituted. Hebrew? But I speak English. I have just a thing for you. But I speak English? The title God is so common to most that it doesn't even dawn on them that God is not a name. The title God in our English language can be used for any deity, past or present. Even Satan is referred to as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. Most are unaware that when they say hallelujah, they are actually saying in Hebrew, praise Yah, Yah being the short form of Yahweh. Many popular names in the Bible also have the shortened form of Yahweh's name in them. For example, Jeremiah, meaning Yah will rise. Isaiah, Yah has saved. Zechariah, Yah has remembered. The references to the importance of the name Yahweh are all through the Bible, even the Ten Commandments. The Third Commandment, properly translated, says, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh thy Elohim in vain. For Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Vain in Hebrew is Shah, and means making useless. Isn't it interesting that the true saints spoken of in the prophetic passage of Revelation 3.8 did not neglect his name Yahweh. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. We have an important free booklet we are offering to you today called, But I Speak English. 
This booklet answers common questions many have when confronted with the name Yahweh and the decision to begin using it. To receive your copy, call 573-896-9248 or write P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. You can request and read this booklet and many more online at YRM.org. Have you always wanted to know more about the Bible, but studying the Bible just seemed overwhelming? Have you always wanted to make sense of it all, but lacked the time and structure to really get a grasp of in-depth Bible understanding? If so, call Clicker right today and join our free Bible Correspondence course. This course is eye-opening, fun, and easy for anyone who desires to learn more Bible truth. With numerous lessons on many interesting topics, you will immediately begin learning truths that even those graduating from seminaries would like to know. Our course covers the true meaning of seemingly conflicting scriptures, the holy days of the Bible and their significance for us today, scripturally clean foods and the benefits of living a biblically healthy lifestyle, the origins of Christmas and the prophet Jeremiah's warning against them, and much, much more. This is graduate school for any Bible believer who wants a more in-depth and comprehensive understanding of the scriptures. We are always adding new lesson topics. Enrollment is absolutely free. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received, freely give. This course is a gift of understanding from the Discover the Truth TV program and Yahweh's Restoration Ministry. Really, that's great. To start receiving your Bible lessons, simply submit your request to Discover the Truth. P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. Ask for Bible Mini Course Enrollment. You can also call in your request to area code 573-896-9248 and ask the operator for the free offer, Bible Mini Course Enrollment. Or visit our website at www.yrm.org and click on the Bible Mini Course link. There you can select any three lessons at a time absolutely free. In the Bible, our Savior told a parable, among many that he told. One is about the pearl of great price, the land that had the very expensive treasure on it that this man sold everything to purchase. You know, Yahweh seeks those who desire with all their being to follow him. For most, one of the biggest obstacles to the prize of salvation is so subtle, one barely knows it's there. I have here a, a little model of the space shuttle, a little uh, trinket I found one day and bought it. And when I activate it, it puts this little shuttle in motion around the, around the Earth. This little model will continue orbiting unless friction ultimately stops it. Once it stops, it's going to stay stopped unless I apply some more energy to it. Sir Isaac Newton discovered that objects in motion tend to stay in motion, going in the same direction, the same speed, unless acted upon by an outside force. Newton further discovered that objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless energized by a force. Scientists call this phenomenon inertia. Well, this model would have remained permanently motionless unless I had done something to energize it. The principle of inertia works spiritually as well. In fact, probably the biggest obstacle to changing one's life is inertia. The next is fear of the unknown. These work in, in tandem in pairs to, to hinder the acceptance of truth. We humans generally stay in our comfort zones unless forced to make changes. Being we, by nature, resist change, only a small percentage of individuals ever will try a new path. Yet the Bible shows that these are the very ones Yahweh seeks. They are the ones being drawn out now from this world to follow in a new and better way, the way of life found in the Word. Yahweh never sought out the masses for Himself. He always chose the small group. You know, we all get stuck in our personal routines that can become ruts. We like our comfort zones. It's, it's safe, at least so we think. We don't have to endure questions or criticisms and keep the customs we grew up with that fill us with so much nostalgia. It's comfortable. It's easy. Tradition is one of the biggest of all ruts. Tradition is also inertia that keeps us motionless, 
keeps us from advancing in our spiritual walk. Maybe you feel called right now. If so, we hope you don't make one big error. We hope you don't strain out what you are hearing through the filter of your past understanding and religious traditions. Going the way taught in the scriptures means to give up tired old traditional fallacy. That was the way it always worked in the Bible and especially in the New Testament. Faulty religious tradition were set aside and a new direction was taken. If all of that past baggage were correct, Yahweh would not be calling you out now with the truth of his name. You'd already have the truth. His name is Sabbath. It's all in his call for obedience. Paul said you can't stay where you are and expect progress. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Almighty Yahweh. Some will ask us, how can you know if you're correct? How do you know you're correct? You're not a mega denomination. Well, you know, Yahweh never worked with the mega group, the large mass of people. He said he chose Israel not because they were the greatest, but because they were the fewest. He deliberately chose not to work with many, but only a select few. Yet look what he accomplished with just a few. It's been said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Think revolutions and how they start with only a few. Think Yahshua and his 12 men. The greatest revolution this earth has ever witnessed started with just a few. Frankly, only a few will take hold of the truth. Matthew 7, 14 reads, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Our Savior, Yahshua, also had to deal with inertia, resistance to change, and the power of tradition in his listeners. This was quite evident in the religious establishment of his day. They held their traditions above Scripture. And the same goes today. Tradition, it seems, is more important to most people than what the scriptures say, and oftentimes they conflict. People will do what they have always done or were taught to do before letting plain scripture become their guide. The lesson is don't allow the majority, don't allow the common way to determine your thinking because the majority is often wrong. In Matthew 13, Mark 6, Luke 4, in John 4, we learn that Yahshua, the Messiah, came to his hometown of Nazareth and was met with raw hostility. On the Sabbath, he enters a synagogue and teaches. Luke says that Yahshua performed a reading of Scripture, then claimed he was the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah 61, 1-2. And the crowd contemptuously questions the origin of his teachings. You can also look at Mark chapter 3. And they disparage him for being a lowly carpenter's son and himself just a carpenter. In Matthew and Mark, the crowd referred to Yahshua as the brother of James, Simon, Joseph, and Judas. They also mentioned his sister, suggesting that this was just an ordinary family. How can this be anybody great? And criticizing his quite different teachings. Yahshua rebukes them, saying, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. In Matthew 1357, he says, we read, And they were offended in him, but Yahshua said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Notice how their attitudes stifle any progress. Matthew states that Yahshua didn't do many miracles there because they didn't believe him. Could it be because their attitude stifled the spirit? Or did Yahshua believe their attitudes rendered his miracles pointless? Could be both. Mark says that Yahshua did few miracles except for healing some sick people there. Luke's account says they drove him out of town to the top of a hill intending to throw him off, but he gets away. Well, we have a lot more for you, and stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Overcoming inertia in our lives takes a little effort, but that effort will pay unbelievable dividends in the end if we're faithful to the truth of the Word. Now, something else we learn about breaking the dusty old mold that's been part of our lives. Whenever we endeavor to do something like start a building project or even just cook dinner or whatever, we create disruption. We, we move things around and things get out of place and uh, it's, it's not always a, a pretty sight. Once we decide to embark on the truth, we create disturbance. Movement can't exist without disturbance. You know, a boat traveling through the water creates waves. Uh, my car makes noise when I drive it that I can't help. Movement and progress inevitably disturb peace and comfort zones. And many people don't like to take on projects for the mess that they must live with when they're doing them. But when finished, they're sure glad they did. Joshua got a lot of people angry at him. He was a mover and a shaker, and so did Paul. So did all the apostles, of which history says all met untimely deaths. They weren't well liked by the establishment, but that never stopped them. They had the word, and they professed that they followed the truth as they must. There's another aspect to overcoming inertia, and that's faith. Faith combined with desire to, to act on what you believe can move mountains. You can have all the desire in the world, but if you don't have faith, then you will not act accordingly. And you may not act at all. You'll be stopped by inertia. Where do you suppose we would be if some of the great inventors and innovators throughout history hadn't had the faith in themselves in what they were doing? These people pressed on with their ideas in spite of negative comments and attitudes from the people around them and in spite of numerous failed attempts because they believed in what they were doing. Thomas Edison tried hundreds of times to create the light bulb. When asked about the failures, he said, I don't fail, I didn't fail those hundred times, he said. I found hundreds of ways how not to create a light bulb. So he had a good positive attitude. You might ask, how do I develop faith? Well, you know, repeated instruction in the Word, hearing and learning the Word over and over enhances our belief in it. And that's why study is so important. It reinforces the unconscious mind. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, he says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Yahweh. That means that every time we listen to a good message or attend a Bible study or read the scriptures, our faith grows, if we are attentive, of course, and open to the truth. If you have little knowledge of Yahweh and His Word, you're going to have little faith in it. This little model space shuttle that I was showing will go fast or slow depending on how much force I put into spinning it. Which brings me to Newton's second law of motion, which says the rate of change of momentum of a body is proportional to the force applied to it and is in the direction of the applied force. In spiritual terms, the success in overcoming sin and the world is proportionate to how much effort we're willing to put into it. Many turned down Yahshua's invitation to follow Him. They had something more important to do, or they simply lacked the faith. Faith in Him and His mission. One young man who approached the Messiah liked his own wealth better and couldn't give it up. He couldn't serve two masters. In his parable of the wedding supper in Matthew 22, Yahshua invited this called out person and that called out person to come, but no one came. They had more pressing matters. They were more locked into the world. One headed back to his farm, his comfort zone, another to his business, making a success in this life and doing what he knew how to do and afraid to step out into something new. So inertia took over. Keep going in the same old direction and nothing changes. The second law of motion is illustrated in both the on fire and the lukewarm individual. On fire is John the Baptist. He's consumed by his mission. It is his whole life. He has nothing for this worldly existence. When he pushed, he pushed hard, and he pushed constantly. You could not help be amazed by this man and drawn to him. The Savior said that there was no greater individual on earth. How would you like to get that honor from the Messiah himself? This flip side of this high-energy individual is the lackadaisical person, the lukewarm Laodicean, the dabbler, the minimal fulfiller, doing just enough to squeeze by. These are those who think that giving or doing a little once in a while really excites Yahweh, makes him just want to reward them handsomely. That's not the message of Scripture, as we will see next. 
You know, Newton's third law of motion is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. No action equals no movement. There's one way to ensure you never make any mistakes, or for that matter, any spiritual progress, and that is don't ever do anything. Sit in your rocking chair and fritter away your life, seeking the pleasures and entertainment of the world. It's safe and it's secure. You won't have to face any criticism. It gives no one any reason to dislike you, nor any reason to like you, for that matter, perhaps. Safe, secure, and a total squandering of life, all adding up to zero impact on, on life, on anyone. Nothing accomplished, no reward. Just go out, dig up your talent, and hand it back to Yashua when he returns with a note, well, at least I kept it safe for you. The answer to this kind of attitude is found in Matthew 25, verse 30, where Yashua says that that type of person, of him, he says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He, he'll tell you that he, you took your gift of life and wasted it on your own desires and satisfactions. Why should I reward that, he asked. So in other words, if you want to be a profitable servant pleasing to Yahweh and receive the suitable rewards of this coming kingdom, you must first get off your backside, get bold, stand for the truth, and shake the earth, or at least your corner of it. Well, we're glad you joined us today and stay tuned next time for another Discover the Truth. To request any of our free booklets, DVDs, or CDs, write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043, or call 573-896-9248. We urge you to visit our extensive ministry website at yrm.org. There you will find articles and booklets to read or request, archived sermons, music, live streaming worship services, and much more. For information about this program or to watch past programs, visit discoverthetruth.tv. Thank you for letting us into your home today. We hope you tune in next week as we bring you another exciting episode of Discover the Truth.